Well, Barry Brook, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you. Could we start talking about the events in Japan recently? Do they show the vulnerability of nuclear power or the way it's managed? I think they show the vulnerability of any human infrastructure to the forces of nature, especially when they're unleashed with such fury as they were with that massive earthquake, the largest one to hit Japan in recorded times and a 10 metre tsunami. I don't think it's reasonable to expect any infrastructure along a coastline like that to, to survive an event like that. But what it does highlight is that decisions were made back in the 60s when that power plant was planned and built that didn't anticipate the scale of of the natural disaster that occurred here. Well, is there a question of the design of these stations and future stations? So these are amongst the oldest nuclear power plants in Japan and they're put along the coastline for the sensible reason that they can use seawater to cool them. And as part of the design, they were protected not only against earthquakes by seismically isolating the, the plant itself, but by tsunamis. They predicted up to a 6.5 metre tsunami and had protected against that. But of course, as events turned out, the tsunami was even bigger than that and it washed over the plant. Seems like it damaged the diesel generators that were supplying backup power. There was a chain of diesel generators, in fact, each one a redundant generator on the one before it. All of those were destroyed by the tsunami. The fuel tanks that would supply the diesel for many days for them seem to have washed away. And the emergency cooling water as well was also damaged such that they ended up having to use seawater to cool them. The design of those 40-year-old plants actually survived the earthquake that they were, desi they were designed for an earthquake seven times less than what they could hit by, and yet they managed to survive that, but it was a tsunami that got them. You suggested, though, in your blog site that it's not beyond the wit of engineering to have designed a backup plan that would have kept those plants functioning with power. I think it's clear that the the risk that a tsunami faced and the fact that all of those redundant generators were wiped out in one blow um, suggests that there wasn't enough prudent forethought for that risk. And in any sort of major accident that occurs in any industry, there's a period of introspection afterwards um, and looking at what went wrong, just like in anything in our lives, and trying to take the salient lessons learned and and use that in the future. And so I see the announcements of governments around the world to relook at the safety of their current nuclear power plants. That's an eminently sensible thing to do because you can look at all of the contingencies that they've allowed for and say, well, what if the situation in Japan happened to us? Are we then prepared? That's learning from the lessons of history. Is it possible to ever design a safe nuclear power plant as such? We already have safe nuclear power plants really safe nuclear power plants. I mean, we've had to have the, the highest order of natural disaster in order to endanger this plant, but it's not possible to design one that is risk-free. There will always be some element of risk, but that's true for any sort of energy generation source or indeed just about any large infrastructure that we require. And to give you an example, we still depend heavily, obviously, on fossil fuels and on petroleum and natural gas. There was a refinery uh, located outside of Tokyo that was damaged by the earthquake. A number of large containers uh, containing um, petroleum products exploded in enormous explosions. Dozens of people around that area were killed. Vast amounts of chemical pollution were spewed into the atmosphere as well as that and rained down on habitable areas. Could you avoid that with extra engineering? Probably not. If we're going to use liquid fuels, we're always going to have those sort of problems as well. But I find it sort of morbidly fascinating that people have ignored those sort of disasters and have focused so intently on the problems at Fukushima Nuclear Power Station, which although catastrophic in the sense of damage to that infrastructure and the safety of the people trying to lock that plant down, um, you know, is, is really serious, it hasn't endangered in any significant way any member of the public so far. In other words, there's a perception of danger. There's a real... There's, and I think it links back to this real concern people have for radiation and a misunderstanding of radiation. I mean, if you think about it logically, radiation's all around us. It's in the rocks, it's in the food we eat. When we decide to take an aeroplane flight, we're increasing our radiation dose significantly. If we decide to live in a mountainous area rather than down by the coastline, we're increasing our radiation dose. Uh, you can't escape that. That's a risk that everyone faces. But it's not really comparable to the, the risks they're facing at the moment in Japan, is it? Well, it is for the general public, because the general public, the sort of radiation doses that they're getting, these pulsed doses where it's rising above background, are not as high as you would um, get if you decided to live in the mountains for a year. 
compared to living on the coastline. It's about you know a tenth of that sort of radiation dose. So it's a matter of whether people can ever really overcome that fear of radiation, given that they have overcome a whole range of other fears of risks and are willing to take them, flying on an aeroplane, living next to a coal-fired power station, having a petroleum refinery near a city. You know, we're willing to accept those risks. Now, you're not a nuclear scientist by training, but you've come to the debate from climate change perspective and you're an enthusiast for nuclear industry. How did you make that journey and why did you draw that conclusion? Well, my principal concern was to look at really uh, practical ways of solving the problem of moving away from fossil fuels, given that um, a big priority of mine was to avoid dangerous climate change. And so I was willing to look at all of the options and, and look at them from a um, from a, a logical perspective. And so I looked at the various renewable energy options and I've looked at nuclear power, and I can see roles for both of them. But overall, my decision based on the science and engineering of generating large amounts of electricity that our society requires, so I'm not trying to push any barrow, I'm not paid by any uranium industry, I'm a university academic. You know. The only thing I get out of this is trying to help save the planet. And, and that's my big motivation and will continue to be. Won't renewables get it done though? Well, if they could, it'd be fantastic. But as it stands, there's only one form of renewable energy that's ever been able to supply large amounts of reliable power, and that's hydro. So in some places, that's built on a large scale. I mean, China, for instance, they've just opened um, a few years ago the Three Gorges Dam. That's 22 gigawatts of power. That's almost as much power as all of the east coast of Australia. But it's geographically restricted, there are, and there are only certain places you can build large dams, and there's a lot of community opposition to them. We have wind and solar and so on, and I hope they do well, but history isn't isn't with them. Um, nowhere in the world have they been able to supplant fossil fuels, and really that's the key. If we're going to replace uh, fossil fuels and solve the climate change problem, we must get rid of coal, and we must get rid of gas. And right now, the only power source that has been able to do that is nuclear power and hydropower. Now, you run a blog where you discuss these issues. What's been the response since the crisis in Japan? There's been enormous hunger for information. And of course, a blog is a mix of information and opinion, and I'm unashamed about that. So I've offered my opinions on what I think is going on, what are the risks. I've made some predictions. Some of them have been right, some of them have been wrong. Um, and I've certainly been pilloried for the predictions I've got wrong, and um, no one's really mentioned the ones I've got right. So we'll look at it in the cold, hard light of day but certainly had a huge amount of interest. And what are they saying? Well, people are, are using the blog to try and diagnose the problems and, and provide streams of information, which is really useful for people. So I might provide a summary each day and then and through hundreds of comments, people will provide updates. Uh, but there's also been some nasty stuff, you know, people sending me um, emails saying I'm a, I'm a shill for the nuclear industry or that I don't care about the people in Japan and, and that's hurtful. I mean, my wife is Japanese, I care a lot about Japan, I've lived there um, in the past, and um, I'm trying to provide an information um, service and some opinions on what's going on to try and help inform people better. And so it is hurtful um, when people attack me for trying to do that. And do you think the nuclear industry in the past has kind of lost the public debate? Oh, absolutely. Um, but we know who's won the public debate, or at least the private debate, which is what matters, and that's fossil fuels. They've won it in the past. The world continues to get 80% of its energy from fossil fuels, and events like this will mean they will continue to win it. Um, places like Australia should be using nuclear power. I mean, it's really sensible. We have a large amount of uranium. Uh, we have the technology to be able to provide safe nuclear power, yet we rely on coal because coal is also cheap. And I'm afraid that events like this, the way they tarnish people's perception of nuclear energy, and yet people are willing to ignore the risks, the huge risks associated with coal, not just from climate change, but also the health risks from just burning the stuff and throwing the pollution into the local atmosphere. People will seem, it seems, will be willing to, to continue to accept those risks and build more coal. So I would love it if renewable energy could somehow emerge from the darkness at less than 1% of our global power supply and somehow displace fossil fuels but I can't see it happening. So I'm depressed by the events in Japan because I see it as a great victory for fossil fuels. Barry Brook, thanks for talking to One Plus One. It's a pleasure.